Now it is time to take longer strides. Time for a great new American enterprise. Time for this nation to take a clearly leading role in space achievement, which in many ways may hold the key to our future on Earth. You can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. So you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something. because you happened to live during a remarkable time in human history. The planetary revolution, when humanity transitioned, becoming a multi-planetary species. In that time, our numbers would explode by orders of magnitude. Our technology and standard of living would improve to levels previously thought impossible, and our self-conception would change forever. It so happened that I was sat in the sun with a book, and just as I was about to nod off, a little voice called out, Excuse me, what is this for? A small ant had crawled across the page of my book, and was now sat staring up at me. What? I said. Excuse me, the ant said. What is this for? What is what for? I said. This great black and white expanse I'm standing on now. It tapped the book with a little black leg. Look, I said, you wouldn't understand even if I explained it to you. That might be so, the ant said, but though I am very small, I am also very curious, and I don't want to turn to dust, having known nothing at all. So if you would, please, what is this for? He stood up on his two back legs, eagerly awaiting my answer, and his antennae stood to attention, most respectfully. I said, ah, it's like this. You're standing on a page. Pages are made from trees. We put lots of them together and call it a book. What is a book for then? The ant said. Well, it stores thoughts, I said. That way we can transmit them to other people very far away. How? The ant said. Now look, this isn't the time or place, I said, a little too firmly. The ant bowed his tiny head and his antennae wilted. I said softly, look, you see those little black squiggles, excuse me, to you very big black squiggles about you on the page. The ant nodded. Those are words and numbers. They don't look like words and numbers, the ant said. They represent them, I said. Hmm, the ant said, and thought about this a while. I said, do you understand? The ant said, not really, you were right, it's beyond me. But though I'll never be as clever as you animals, I'm at least a little cleverer than I was a moment ago, so thank you for that. You're welcome, I said. Well, good luck on being a thing in the world, the ant said. Good luck to you too, I said. The little ant made off on his way and disappeared into the grass. I read to the end of my page, but could not forget the little ant. Eventually, I looked up from the book, to the trees, to the mountain, to the sky. The moon was climbing up for evening. Birds were migrating in the distance. I called out, Excuse me, what is this for? What? came a booming voice above. This great green and blue sphere I'm standing on now. I patted the ground with my foot. What is all this for? Look, the voice said. You wouldn't understand even if I explained it to you. That might be so, I shouted, but though I am very small, I am also very curious, and I don't want to turn to dust having known nothing at all. So if you would, please, what is all this for? And the voice said, It's like this. Essentially, life is a game. There are natural and man-made laws that serve as rules. There is a beginning and an end. There is a game board we play on that we call Planet Earth. And there are decisions and moves that we make that determine where and how we move on the board. Of course, we all want to win. Some of us do, and some of us don't. But that begs the question, how 
does one win? Unlike a normal game, there is no time after life for us to bask in and enjoy a victory. And so, if we wish to truly experience winning the game of life, we must frame our definition of how we win accordingly, so that we win while the game is still in play. Winning the game of life is not predicated merely by the quantity of material successes that we have accumulated by the end of it. Sure, it is enjoyable and important to acquire things within the game of life, but the accumulation of things like wealth, material excess, fame or status tend to easily be confused as the ultimate end game, but they are not. They are just parts of the game. And furthermore, each win of this kind is generally short-lived. It is just like how winning a board game, video game or sports game might feel good when it occurs and for a little while after. But the feeling soon fades and you return to your normal state. And so it is important that the state that you return to is a victory in it of itself. In the case of the game of life, not only is the sense of fulfillment from material wins short-lived, but the accumulation of material points does not matter much at the end of it. These points don't go anywhere with you when you are dead and gone. Instead, it is about how much you enjoyed the game of pursuing the points in the first place. Ironically, you truly win the game of life when you realize and embrace that it is a game. When you become aware that against all odds you were somehow rendered into this existence and are now able to play and enjoy the most enthralling, sophisticated and entertaining game ever to exist. A game that is so complex and uncertain that you can never completely predict what's going to happen next. A game that is always updating. A game that you can come up with rules for, change existing ones, unlock new levels and uncover hidden settings. And the quality of your life experience truly maximizes when you realize that you have already won by being able to do any of this. We are so small, it took no more than one cycle of oxygen for essentially all clear traces of home to disappear from my vision forever. All the greatest heroes and sages and leaders and so on, from here I don't see any of them. We forget that we are a life still in its adolescent years at best yet to even really leave home. Our species still filled with the angst and juvenile rebellion of a teenager. The universe must laugh at our arrogant ignorance, our smug righteousness, our poutiness. We still think we know everything, but we know damn near nothing about anything. Like our pioneering ancestors of every form, discovered lands and worlds and ways of being that we take for granted now as the status quo, great unknown lands of the future await us great unknown manners and knowledge of how to live and be. Unknown turmoil too, casualties of this kind and far, far worse, of course. To grow up, to age, to toy with the universe and venture out into the unknown always carries its great uncertainty and risk, but it is perhaps one of the most beautiful imperatives of our kind to do so. To live is to be afraid but perhaps to center that fear on something that unites and grows and reveals wonder is to be afraid with some purpose. I don't know, what else could life possibly be but a series of new horizons, new views, a constant rediscovery of beauty and wonder. I'm going to die a casualty of this cause, and I wouldn't want it any other way. If I have any remaining wish, it's that this was not all in vain. This fatal mission and every pair of shoulders that it stood on every prior fatal mission, every prior successful mission. I hope that more and more of my kind will see and feel what I do right now with less finality and more intention, to continue on into the darkness, bringing the lights of their own creation, illuminating the heavens and revealing them as new homes. Today, the great frontiers are above us, 
into the once believed heavens that we need not be dead to touch. We can touch them now. We will. We will if we can survive our teenage carelessness and anguish and avoid the irreversible self-harm that so many adolescences fall victim to. If we continue to grow and learn and survive together, we will live together up here somewhere, into forever. We either live together or die together. I don't know how long my suit will survive after me. I don't know if these words will ever be heard by anyone else. No matter the case, I'll be okay. I'll be dead. But if anyone does find me, or rather, what was once me, if anyone finds this recording, please know that I was happy while speaking these words. I have lived a good life, an aesthetic voyager who lived and died by the space that enthralled him. If you have not already, I hope, even if just for a moment, you see and feel what I do right now. I hope you see past me. I hope you find reason to continue as a string of life, extending further and further out, reaching with excitement and wonder into the infinite yet continually insufficient frontier. Don't cut the string short for trivial, absurd reasons. If it's absurd to continue, then it's absurd to cut it all short. And if you can't find the reasons to continue, my friendly suggestion is... Let's suppose that you were able every night to dream any dream you wanted to dream. And that you could, for example, have the power within one night to dream 75 years of time. Or any length of time you wanted to have. And you would naturally, as you began on this adventure of dreams, you would fulfill all your wishes. You would have every kind of pleasure you could conceive. And after several nights of 75 years of total pleasure each, you would say, well, that was pretty great. But now let's, um, let's have a surprise. Let's have a dream which isn't under control. Well, something is going to happen to me that I don't know what it's going to be. And uh, you, you would dig that and come out of that and say, wow, that was a, a close shave, wasn't it? And then you would get more and more adventurous and you would make further and further out gambles as to what you would dream. And finally, you would dream where you are now. You would dream the dream of living the life that you are actually living today. That would be within the infinite multiplicity of choices you would have, of playing that you weren't God. So then, this means that you're not victims of a scheme of things, of a mechanical world or of an autocratic God. The life you're living is what you have put yourself into. Only you don't admit it because you want to play the game that it's happened to you. Because if you play life on the supposition that you're a helpless little puppet that got involved, or if you play it on the supposition that it's a, a frightful, serious risk and that we really ought to do something about it and uh, so on, it's a drag. There's no point in going on living unless we make the assumption that the situation of life is optimal. And it makes you realize, you see, how, how great things are. So in this idea then, everybody is fundamentally the ultimate reality. Not God in a politically kingly sense, but God in the sense of being the self, the deep down basic whatever there is. And you're all that. Only you're pretending you're not. On your deathbed, you will think back on your life, and you might have regrets. You will wish you'd worked harder, made more money, spent less time with your family, less time with your friends. You will reminisce fondly about all the evenings you stayed home alone so you could refresh Facebook over and over. On your deathbed, you will be grateful for many things. Thank God you stayed in that job you hated for fear of rocking the boat. Thank God you settled for friendships with total bellends instead of making the effort to meet people who were on your wavelength. Thank God you ignored your dream career so you wouldn't upset your family. 
On your deathbed, you will be glad you didn't tell those humans you loved that you loved them before they were gone forever. You will be glad you spent years taking passive-aggressive comments personally from people who were probably just miserable dicks themselves. You will be glad that you were too cautious to pursue your actual passions in life. On your deathbed, you certainly won't think back on whatever it is you worried about constantly and laugh at how utterly insignificant it actually was compared to what a fucking amazing time you could have been having with a body that hadn't started falling apart yet in an age more enlightened than any that had come before while the people you loved were still alive. You were young back then, and that was a resource more sought after than antimatter, more expensive than a hero in Star Wars Battlefront 2. Life was fleeting, and luckily you wasted the entire thing. What's that? You only have an extremely limited period of time alive? Well, better polish off another one then to that German dominatrix whose name you can neither pronounce nor remember, and then write a long list of things you'll do tomorrow, which you will somehow find an excuse not to for the 4,000th day running. When you were young, you wanted a million things. On your deathbed, you want only one, and that is to be young again. On your deathbed, you certainly won't start having awful realizations, like how the point of making money probably wasn't to make money, but to do cool stuff with it for yourself and others. That the point of a long life probably wasn't to put off your real plans until tomorrow, but rather to give you more time to pursue them today. Now. Literally fucking now. That the point of being a talking monkey in space probably wasn't to sit watching YouTube videos by some pompous British knob end, but to have a good time with what little time there was, and to make other talking monkeys feel good too. You were born into an age science fiction couldn't even imagine, when your species had access to clean drinking water through magic pipes, to practically infinite information through magic wires, to devices that can materialise pizza in magic boxes at your door within one hour or less. And despite being surrounded by miracles on a daily basis, despite being matter that has woken up, despite the entire universe contriving to create you, you still convinced yourself that the odds were stacked against you, somehow, that all the good ideas have been had, apparently, and that everything is shit for some reason. So, great. However you saw it at the time, the future was a branching network of opportunities and adventure. At any moment, you could have begun the project of refashioning your life into what you actually wanted it to look like. There would be risks, there would be bad days, there would be stress, but that was nothing compared to the misery of realising an entire lifetime had been wasted on doubts and self-sabotage. The hard road was easy. The easy road was hard. It took 14 billion years to make you and only 90 to fuck it up. And with self-doubt and apathy, you did fuck it up. But that is irrelevant now. At the end, all things considered, all beds made, all eyes dotted and T's crossed. From Indonesia to Australia to Russia, we find caves decorated in strange hunting scenes, many of them 20, 30, 40,000 years old. We don't know what the ancients were doing, but some theories suggest that maybe these paintings were an attempt at magic, probably to make hunting more successful, the first evidence we have of humans trying to utilize a science to control the world around them. How far we've come since our early attempts at magic, and what beautiful things we found along the way. It turns out time isn't an absolute, and reality is made of fields and interactions, and and who knows what else. Nature is bigger than we ever could have imagined, and more elaborate than we ever could have imagined. And despite the successes of our theories of reality, we are once again lost in the forest. Quantum mechanics still won't hold hands with general relativity yet. On top of that, there's a large percentage of the universe that's either invisible, or there's something wrong with our conception of gravity. We have no idea what particles are doing, or are, before we observe them. We have no idea why the expansion of the universe is accelerating. But you know what? If we make it that long, in 500 years, many of these questions will be answered, and though we can't guess at what those answers will be yet, it seems very unlikely they will be Magic 1 explanations because none of them have been so far. Do the planets really affect human destiny? Who knows, but it's unlikely Saturn's current position is the reason your dog pooped on the carpet this morning. Are aliens here already? Who can say, but it's rather hard to believe they mastered interstellar travel and traversed the galaxy in faster than light starships to come to this planet to look specifically up your ass. It does rather seem sometimes like the less our species knows about a thing, the more certain we are of it. We're totally unique biologically on this planet. Oh, no, we're not. Well, at least the sun goes around our planet. No, it doesn't. Well, at least we're at the center of everything cosmically then. Sorry, no, we live in a galactic suburb. You know, should we just start a religion? Oh, come on. Rampant egomania thinly veiled behind British self-deprecation. You knew this was coming. And anyone can join this religion and everyone gets a free cat. And there's no rules except for one, which is if you find yourself in conversation with another human who is boldly making declarations about things that are still totally unknown, as if we got to this point by just making things up and being confident about them. Ah, oh, consciousness is so simple, how haven't scientists worked it out, etc, etc. You just reply, NOFGIO, a little acronym, a mantra, if you will. 
and it stands for, in short, No one fucking knows yet, okay? How long have we been wrong about almost everything? And look at what we got when we accepted we probably were. Black holes, quantum fields, time dilation, antibiotics, those umbrella hat things. We didn't kill magic, we just learned to use it properly and carefully, and it is very much alive and well in the form of the scientific method. And the pictures we have now of the world subatomically and galactically are more insane than any story we could have come up with. And even better, as far as we've tested, they're accurate. This is the true age of magic. Now. Right now. We didn't get dragons, but you can take a big silver bird across the ocean if you want, and they'll serve you wine as you're fucking doing it. And we got here by checking our intuitions against the world, and if they didn't work, we discarded them. And if they did work, we took the next step on the road to finding out what this fishbowl we're living in really is. All truth is one. In this light, may science and religion endeavor together for the steady evolution of mankind. From darkness to light, from narrowness to broad-mindedness, from prejudice to tolerance. It is the voice of life that calls us to come and learn. We all must have gone through that phase as a kid when it hit us, well, people die eventually, and mum and dad are people, and I'm a person, so- Oh god! Some of us, including your pompous narrator here, never recovered from that phase. It is simply too much to live as the only animal that knows its projects and loves and lifetimes are limited, and when the animal is gone, after a while, it'll be as though the animal never was at all. And that is a notion too wide and spiky to fit inside the head. The things we will miss after we're gone. The parties, the births of humans we would come to love, all the walks, all the hugs, all the plucky steps into the dark our species will take yet. Homo sapiens? Yeah, right. Homo nihilus, more like. The only animal conscious of its approaching demise, and conscious of the world's approaching demise too. I suspect you, like me, have run into these people in life who are terribly clever, and yet terribly broken. Because they've looked into the abyss and concluded that on a long enough timescale, and in a universe so wide and apparently indifferent, we have no ultimate significance, and the point has dropped out of everything for them. But there is a middle way, between denial, I'm so fucking important, look at my bank balance, etc., and despair, there's no point to anything if we all just go off into the dark, etc. Because the world is just as fantastical as it is horrific, and it's just as arbitrary to lose hope as it is to find it. If everything was forever, would that really change so much? 80 years or a trillion, beer would still taste just as good, wasps would still be pricks. Fuck you, wasps! And maybe tomorrow we'll kill aging and death and stay up infinitely past bedtime. But as it stands today, we don't have the science yet. And so God-fearing or not, we have to find some way of making peace with the thing. For you, it might be religion or some variant of spirituality and fair enough. But I'll tell you what works for me personally though. When it's late and I can't sleep and the abyss starts whispering about how I'm gonna go into the dark one day, I keep in mind that whether I like it or not, I am part of something bigger. An experiment conducted across the entire planet, conducted across all of history, called us. Somewhere in the future, we are gone, and someone who loves us is remembering us. Somewhere ahead of that, they are gone, and someone who loves them is remembering them. The interminable rise and fall of generations. How many of us have been and gone down here since we became homo sapiens? Billions, at the very least. To have stubbed one's toe. To have heard a new word and looked it up. To have yelled at the GPS as though it's the GPS's fault you got lost. To have watched another human blowing their nose or picking their teeth or something equally disgusting, and quietly thought to oneself, Oh fuck, I've fallen in love with you haven't I? Just to have been anything, what a weird honour. If sleep is just death being shy, then waking up is atoms being miraculous. The fact that for about 80 years atoms know they're even atoms at all, courtesy of being humans. Birth, death, the silly bit in between. If none of it has any ultimate significance, if on a cosmic scale none of it matters, does that really fucking matter? We won't last forever, but while we're here, what a silly decision it would be to waste our day out in the cosmos. That brief period of time when matter woke up. On a world as interesting as this one, with hair as excellent as yours, with all the other talking carbon units around us, who we can hang out with, and be fond of, and talk shit to, and keep the abyss well at bay. And if all that wasn't enough, just in case, in the words of Ursula K. Le Guin, a human who left us just last year, when I take you to the valley, you'll see the blue hills on the left and the blue hills on the right. The rainbow and the vineyards under the rainbow late in the rainy season. And maybe you'll say, there it is, that's it. But I'll say, a little farther. And we'll go on, I hope. And you'll see the roofs of the little towns and the hillsides yellow with wild oats. A buzzard soaring and a woman singing by the shadows of a creek in the dry season. And maybe you'll say, let's stop here, this is it. But I'll say, a little farther yet. 
and we'll go on and you'll hear the quail calling on the mountain by the springs of the river, and looking back, you'll see the river running downward through the wild hills behind, below. And you'll say, isn't that the valley? And all I will be able to say is drink this water of the spring, rest here a while. We have a long way yet to go, and I can't go without you. When do you want to die? The Reaper is busy, but he can fit you in right now. Too soon, later perhaps, future you will keep the appointment, old and with a life fully lived, perhaps ever so slightly bored and ready. Now you might think that, but when the appointment whippersnapper you set comes, it is not in the future, because you don't live in the future. You always live in the now, and thus you always die now. Because the Reaper comes for all eventually, humans have formed a relationship with death perverse. Like a hostage who grows to love their kidnapper, humans tell themselves the handful of decades the Reaper gives them is just the right length, that living a truly long and healthy life would get boring and would be unnatural, and imagine all the problems if death took a holiday. And so, the Reaper of Age whispers that he is your friend, always near, growing humans bigger, stronger, healthier, and smarter at first. Then comes his harvest of slow rot. Death is a part of life, he whispers. Death gives life meaning. This is madness. Misery doesn't give happiness meaning. Happiness is meaning itself. If you tortured people to make them better appreciate the pleasures of life, you would be a monster, just like this guy. No parent would ask the Reaper of Age to wrinkle their child's skin, weaken their bones, dim their vision, and their minds, cripple them in a thousand ways over decades to ultimately kill them, to give their life meaning. But what can you do? The world contains pain and death, and so your brain believes the sweet lies that the horrors you can't avoid are good for you. And while death is a part of life, cholera was a part of life until humans developed wells and sewers to separate water from waste. Short-sightedness is a part of life, until it isn't. Just because a thing is natural doesn't make it good or necessary. It's natural to live lives nasty, brutish, and short, and it's natural for humans to look at what indifferent nature provides as the starting point, as a to-do list. Where humans focus, technology ever improves, and with that the ability to make lives better ever improves. And just now, some basic tools with real promise to slow or halt the decay are becoming visible on the horizon. Which raises the question, just how strong is the Reaper of Age? With enough time and attention, can humans craft these basic tools into shields and swords to keep him at bay? Possibly indefinitely? Perhaps. And if so, the first immortal generation may be alive today. A generation that lives a healthy adulthood as long as they wish to. But to make that happen, brains need to be cleared of the millennia of death acceptance. Death is not a solution to future problems imagined. Faced with the changes longer lives will bring, humans will not miss the reaper and construct one to solve their problems. Just as with our larger cities, we don't remix the water to bring back cholera. Humans must discard the learned helplessness the Reaper and their own brains have imposed on them, to instead see the rot and decay not as natural and inevitable, but as a degenerative disease to be attacked like all the others, as the degenerative disease that affects 100% of the population, and is a source of misery untold. Misery not in your distant future, but in your now. And how soon we start the project of focusing our attention and shaping our tools against the Reaper matters. For the difference of but a day might determine what side of the future chasm you find yourself on. Jer Imagine you were alive back in the 1980s and were told that computers would soon take over everything from shopping to dating and the stock market. That billions of people would be connected via a kind of web that you would own a handheld device orders of magnitude more powerful than supercomputers. It would seem absurd, but then all of it happened. Science fiction became our reality and we don't even think about it. We're at a similar point today with genetic engineering. So let's talk about it. Where it came from, 
what we're doing right now, and about a recent breakthrough that will change how we live and what we perceive as normal forever. Casey had had this sort of experience before, but never quite like this. It wasn't a panic attack per se, but certainly somewhere in the same vein of experience. A moment where everything he understood and felt to be true started to crack and peel back, the world shedding its skin and revealing an entirely new image of itself to him. Casey had just finished watching another video on the topic of free will, or more specifically, the lack thereof. Up until more recently, Casey never really paid much interest to this or any similar kind of topic. That sort of stuff always seemed distant, abstract, and unnecessary to him. Of course he had free will. He felt it in every moment. What could possibly be the issue or question? But more recently, as he had become slightly older and more curious, he found it a bit harder to see things so simply and find meaning so easily. Consequently, he had become more interested in topics of philosophy, looking further into different ideas in attempts of better self-understanding and ways of life. And now, after having finished this last video, Casey began to question the obviousness of his own free will. Specifically, the video was about the concept of determinism, which argues that all events, including human actions, are determined exclusively by prior causes. It argues for this by claiming that since all particles and phenomena in the universe operate off of cause and effect patterns, in which there is always a continual chain of preceding explanations, then, like all other things in the universe, so too are human action and choice subject to the same deterministic system. Logically, this made complete sense to Casey. He did not choose the parents he was born to, where he was born, the brain or genetics he was born with, nor the first thoughts and experiences he had. And yet, these things directly affected and led to every thought and experience he had thereafter in an unbroken, linear sequence of cause and effect, a cascading of forces and circumstances that he was not in control of nor totally aware of at any point. And thus, every new spur thereafter, everything that felt like his choosing, was yet another product of some causal fixed thing that he didn't choose beforehand. As a sort of cliché attempt at a witty example, the video he just watched even said within the video itself how he clicked on the video without choosing, all as a result of the sequence of events tracking back to and beyond his birth, the advent of the internet, the invention of the computer, the formation of the earth, all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Fundamentally, Casey agreed with this premise of determinism, but he struggled to see how its implications could possibly be true. He struggled to agree with the idea that he himself did not have the free will that he felt in every moment. And in this, Casey experienced the intense disorienting dissonance that occurs when a truth that one feels intuitively confronts and contradicts with a truth that one knows logically. And his intuition fought back. He wondered to himself what could possibly be the point of life if this were true. The video he just watched seemed to claim that he could still choose to enjoy life and find meaning in it. But how? What sense did this make? How could he choose anything now? How can you reconcile the belief that all of existence is deterministic with the belief that you can find your own meaning in the absurdity? It mustn't be completely true then, Casey rationalized in his head. Over the following several days, Casey considered and tried a number of different things in a hopeful effort to prove this to himself, to find a flaw in the argument against free will. On the Tuesday of that week, on his way home from work, Casey stopped at a small park not far from his apartment to get some fresh air and relax for a little. He sat on a bench, looking out at the pond and people flow around the park, ruminating to himself. Eventually, still struggling to shake the topic off the surface of his mind, Casey found himself thinking about the concept of free will again. He considered how, in this moment, he and he alone wanted to stop at the park. There was no specific reason or event that caused him to do so. No biological or physiological necessity, no external force, nothing other than his own willful desire. He wanted to stop at the park, and so he chose to. And since he chose to, he did. How is this not free will, he wondered to himself. While continuing to think back and forth, a parkgoer's dog happened to run up to where Casey was sitting, sniffing the ground around him profusely. After circling around Casey a couple of times, the dog went on in the other direction, continuing to sniff and follow its nose. As Casey amusingly observed the dog, 
he considered to himself if the dog had any free will. Clearly the dog wanted to find what it was smelling, and it was choosing to follow what it wanted. But was it choosing to want what it was smelling? No, Casey obviously concluded. It was being pulled by a desire that it had no say in. Of course, Casey knew that he was at least some good amount more conscious than the dog, but did this fundamentally allow him to decide what he did or didn't want any more than the dog? He could choose to do what he wanted, but could he choose to want what he wanted? Sure, he chose to go to the park because he wanted to, but why did he want to? He reflected on where this desire came from and couldn't find anything other than a void. It simply emerged into his consciousness from some unknown stream of events and information and thoughts and desires that he was mostly unaware of and did not control. If he could have wanted to want to go to the park, wouldn't he have also had to have wanted to want to want to? And then he would have had to have wanted to want to want to want to, and so on and so forth into infinity, which of course he did not and could not have done. In truth, he concluded, he was no different than the dog being pulled by its nose, conditioned by the treats it finds along the way. He was sitting at the park under no free will of his own. Three days later, on Friday night, Casey was out getting dinner and drinks with a few friends. Once they were sat at the restaurant, Casey decided fairly quickly what he wanted to order, honey barbecue chicken wings. While he waited for the rest of the group to decide what they wanted, Casey ruminated in his head about this and that. At some point, of course, the topic emerged again, and Casey suddenly had the idea to try something, to choose to order something else that he didn't and wouldn't ever actually want to eat. Surely, he thought to himself, since I'd be doing what I don't want for no reason, without being forced to by anyone or anything other than myself, I'd be acting on my own free will and overriding any deterministic sequence. Logically, in this moment, this made great sense to Casey, and so, when the waiter came, he ordered a completely different fish meal that he had no desire to eat. When he did, knowing that it was something Casey didn't like, two of his friends reacted with surprise. One asked him if he liked fish now. Casey, trying not to sound too crazy, briefly explained to them why he ordered what he did. Inevitably, he sounded pretty crazy. After briefly discussing the idea together, casually, one of his friends said, But technically, didn't you still do what you wanted? This simple question shut the whole thing down for Casey. He immediately realized his friend was right. In truth, he wanted to prove his sense of free will to himself more than he wanted to order a meal that he would have otherwise wanted to eat. This, although convoluted, was just another want that he didn't ultimately choose. Why he wanted to prove his free will in this moment more than getting the meal, Casey could not say. It emerged the same way as all other desires, a result of all the information and thoughts and qualities of his temperament leading up to that moment, going all the way back to his birth and beyond. And so, this attempt to escape the cause and effect sequence was itself determined by the very same sequence. In trying to escape the system and prove he had free will, Casey only stepped forward right into it, revealing that he did not. The only difference was, now he had a meal he didn't want. On the following Monday, on his way to work, Casey stopped at a local coffee shop. Upon ordering, the barista asked Casey if he wanted cream or sugar in his coffee. For some reason, this question suddenly spurred an insight and idea in Casey's mind. Somewhat awkwardly, he replied, I don't know and then waited to see what would happen. Naturally, the barista paused and waited in confusion, assuming Casey would follow through and make the decision. Casey did nothing. After a few extra long seconds, in order to finally cut the moment, the barista spoke up and said, wait, so you don't want them or you don't know if you want them? After another brief pause, Casey replied, yeah, you just pick. It doesn't really work like that the barista replied with a somewhat impatient confusion. You either want cream and sugar or you don't. Casey, thinking about how foolish this statement sounded to him now, took a coin out of the little tip container on the counter, flipped it into the air, and caught it. He saw that it landed heads on his hand, and then clumsily said, No cream or sugar. S sorry, thank you. And put the coin back into the container. While waiting for his order, Casey considered how since he had left the decision up to chance, the outcome was totally random. 
not determined by any cause and effect sequence, nor any internal or external force leading up to the outcome. For the moment, he felt an excited sense that he was perhaps onto something, a breaking of the whole system. During the rest of his drive to work, Casey drank some of his coffee, wishing he had gotten cream and sugar. It didn't take more than a few sips for him to realize the absurdity of what he just did. He wanted cream and sugar, but got black coffee. Where was the free will in that? He had no say in the random outcome of the coin flip, and so, sure, it was random, but how could there be any free will in randomness? If anything, he realized this encounter with the barista was only an elaborate example of even less free will, with just some additional awkwardness and no cream or sugar. As more days passed, Casey found himself incapable of finding any loopholes, any cases where he could conclusively find examples of the free will that he once felt and knew he had. He watched countless videos, read books and essays on the topic, and so on. At this point, he found it nearly impossible to deny. The sense that he was the controlling force of his life, it seemed, was in fact an illusion. And this was no longer some abstract idea. Now, he felt it clearly and totally. The switch clicked and the world looked different. The weight of this troublesome truth hit Casey fairly hard as it fell down onto his shoulders. He now found himself in the unfortunate position that afflicts all human beings. He couldn't unknow what he now knew, even if he wanted to. He couldn't go back to ignorance. Ignorance is certainly not a choice. One cannot choose to truly be ignorant of what they already know, for this would require they didn't know it to begin with. And Casey realized now that he never even really had a choice in knowing what he did or didn't at all. That night, he experienced what can only be described as one of the hardest existential crises he'd yet experienced in his life. He struggled to see any point anymore, any meaning. This built up so heavily that later that same night, Casey decided to essentially stop caring, stop trying, stop doing anything really. After all, since he was never really doing anything to begin with, what difference would this make? he thought. For the rest of the night, he sat on his couch and stared at the wall, with no intention of intentionally doing anything else. A renunciation of his life in a radical act of complete fatalism. After several hours of sitting, around midnight, Casey got kind of hungry. Naturally, after tolerating the hunger for as long as he could, he got up and made himself a grilled cheese sandwich with a little pizza sauce. Then he returned to the couch and ate it. He enjoyed it thoroughly. At around 12.55, he felt that he had to use the bathroom, and, naturally, after no longer being able to tolerate the feeling, he got up and went. Then, he returned to the couch, feeling much better. Eventually, at around 2.45 a.m., Casey became sufficiently tired and dozed off to sleep. Over the next couple days, he continued on, sitting, trying to do nothing, scrolling through his phone most of the time, in between staring at the wall. It took no more than a day and a half to begin to feel the absolute absurdity of what he was doing. Still weighed down by his sense of pointlessness though, he stayed put, acting as passively as he could. Eventually, the boredom and desire to do something became so bad, he took out a video game, which he couldn't even remember the last time he played. Any video game for that matter. He was surprised the console even still worked. He started playing and quickly fell into the game, starting the story mode from the beginning, enjoying all the various tasks and challenges along the way. Before he even realized how long he was playing for, he finished the game. Granted, he had already played and beaten the same game when he was younger, but nonetheless, it still felt nice. The time seemed to fly right by. As he watched the final scene of the video game's story conclude, in the sort of corny typical video game tone, one of the characters said, Everything is mostly sorted out now. Couldn't have done it without you. Not a total happy ending, but good enough. Between all the time Casey had to think over the last two days and this line in the video game, in this moment, it hit Casey. The missing piece that put the whole thing back together. He realized he had just thoroughly enjoyed a video game that he knew was fake and had already played. All of the challenges in the game were predetermined and pre-coded and the game operated with specific borders, rules, and controls that all worked towards a story that essentially had just one single path to one single predetermined end. Casey fundamentally had no control over how the game was played and where it went, 
He was just following the storyline as it already existed, experiencing the illusion of him actually creating and performing it. And yet, despite this and his knowledge of it, there he had been, totally and fully immersed, enjoying and finding meaning in it the whole way through. And his active participation was entirely necessary to the experience and the game playing through. Casey realized to himself, there was no other way to live. There was no escaping the illusion if the illusion was him. But there was no need to. Knowing something is an illusion does not stop the illusion from working. Illusions are illusions because they work. I am not my perceptions, he thought to himself, not my choices, not my actions, but I am still the experiencer of the whole, an observer of a consciousness that can observe and navigate and find meaning in the world, the greatest and most beautiful illusion ever created and experienced, and I have a front row seat to it. Nothing changes. The illusion is real. Not too long after this moment, one of Casey's friends called him and asked if he wanted to meet him and a few friends at a local bar. Casey said he did, and within the hour, he got ready, left his apartment, met up with his friends, and enjoyed the rest of the night. The same as he always had. Hello, Internet. Thoughts compete for space in your brain. Cat photos, news stories, belief structures, funny gifts, educational videos, not so educational videos, and your thinking inventory is limited. A thought without a brain to think it dies. Now, we can treat thoughts as though they're alive, specifically alive like germs. That might sound weird, but stick with me. Take jokes. Jokes are thought germs that live in your brain, and when you tell the joke to another brain, you help it to reproduce, just like when you have the flu and sneeze to help it reproduce. This germ gets into its host by snot through the mouth and this one by words through the ear, but it's reproduction either way. Logging onto your social media then is exposing yourself to everyone's mental sneezes, each post a glob of snot with a thought germ trying to get into your brain. If not for permanent residence, then at least long enough to get you to press the share button and sneeze it with everyone you know. In this analogy then, a funny cat photo with the perfect caption is a superflu. Now, just as germs exploit weak points in your immune system, so do thought germs exploit weak points points in your brain, aka emotions. Once inside, thought germs that press emotional buttons get their hosts to spread them more, measurably more. Well, except sadness. Sad thoughts don't get very far. Awe is pretty good, which is why websites that construct thought germs like biological weapons arm them with titles like seven whatevers that will blow your mind or the shocking secret behind this thing. But anger is the ultimate edge for a thought germ. Anger bypasses your mental immune system and compels you to share it like nothing else. Being aware of your brain brain's weak spots is necessary for good mental health, like knowing how to wash your hands. Because even without intentional construction, any thought germ on the internet can, on its own, grow more infectious as it spreads. To talk about why, let's forget anger for a moment and go back to that cat photo. Every photo ever taken is a thought germ, and most die a quick death like the bazillion cat photos, or baby photos, posted on the internet that are never shared. But a mildly funny cat photo can grow into so much more, because just as transatlantic flights were the the best thing to happen to germ germs, so the internet is the best thing to happen to thought germs. For once on board, that cat photo can leap into other brains, and those brains might share it, and here's the key point, occasionally change it. A Photoshop here, a tweaked caption there. Most changes are terrible, but some make the thought germ even funnier, getting more brains to share it, which results in more changes and a shot at superstardom. Thus, a lowly cat photo can achieve global brain domination, at least for a few hours. The internet, with its unparalleled ability to share and randomly change thought germs can't help but make them stronger. With jokes, that's awesome, but with angry germs, not always so awesome, no. Angry germs, the more they're shared, undergo the same process, changing and distorting to be more aggravating. These have a better chance of spreading than their possibly more accurate, but probably also more boring, rivals. But like plagues, thought germs can burn through a population too quickly. Just watch your favorite meme-generating machine for a week and you'll see the life cycle fly by. However, 
some thought germs have found a way around burnout. Now, I must warn you, depending on which thought germs live in your head and which you fight for, the next section might sound horrifying. So please keep in mind, we're talking about what makes some thought germs successful, particularly angry ones, and not how good or how bad the thoughts themselves are. Deep breath, calm. Thought germs can burn out because once everyone agrees, it's hard to keep talking and thus thinking about them. But if there's an opposing thought germ, an argument, then the thinking never has to stop. The disagreement doesn't have to be angry, but again, angry helps. The more visible an argument gets, the more bystanders it draws in, which makes it more visible, which is why every group from the most innocuous internet forum to the national conversation can turn into a double rage storm across the sky in no time. Wait, these thought germs aren't competing, they're cooperating. Working together, they reach more brains and hold their thoughts longer than they could alone. Thought germs on opposite sides of an argument can be symbiotic. One tool symbiotic anger germs in particular can employ is you're with us or against us. Whatever thought germ does leapt to the front of your brain, push it back. This video isn't about that. We're just talking about this tool, which makes it very hard for neutral brains to resist, and its divisiveness also grows its symbiotic partner. This explains why in some arguments gaining more allies also gains more enemies. Because though the participants think they're involved in a fiery battle to the death, from the anger germ's perspective, one side is a field of flowers and the other a flock of butterflies. Of course planting more flowers will get you more butterflies, and getting more butterflies will pollinate more flowers. If there is some argument that splits the population and lasts forever, and that even the most neutral people find difficult to to avoid, you just might be looking at a super successful pair of symbiotic anger germs that have reached ecological stability. Now, one final depressing thought, uh, I mean one more awe-inspiring point that will reveal the secrets of, uh, actually no, it's just depressing. When opposing groups get big, they don't really argue with each other, they mostly argue with themselves about how angry the other group makes them. We can actually graph fights on the internet to see this in action. Each becomes its own quasi-isolated internet sharing thoughts about the other. You see where this is going, right? Each group breeds thought germs about the other, and as before, the most enraging, but not necessarily the most accurate, spread the fastest. The group almost can't help but construct a totem of the other so enraging they'll talk about it all the time, which, now that you know how thought germs grow, is exactly what makes the totem always perfectly maddening. Now, all this isn't to say there's no point in arguing. That's a different video. Or that the internet isn't amazing, or that there aren't things worth trying to change people's minds about. Thought germs of all kinds come and go. But it's useful to be aware of how thoughts can use our emotions to spread and how the more rapidly a thought is able to spread, the more chances it has to become even better at spreading through random changes that are made to it. Sometimes that's great, sometimes it's terrible. But if you want to maintain a healthy brain, it pays to be cautious of thoughts that have passed through a lot of other brains and that poke you where you're weakest. It's your brain. Be hygienic with it. You shared the video, right? Well, if you're still here, you got infected really hard. Only thing left to do is click on screen and sign up to the email list, which will get you exposed to many more thought germs in stick figure video form. In 1952, an author named Ray Bradbury published a short story called A Sound of Thunder. In it, a hunter named Eccles pays $10,000 to travel with Time Safari, a time machine company that takes hunters back to the time of dinosaurs and allows them to hunt the T-Rex. The company guarantees nothing, neither your safety nor your return, and there are strict instructions and expectations for how the hunters should behave once they travel back in time. When they travel 60 million years back in time, they notice the path that has been laid by the company. It floats 6 inches above the earth and is the only path that the hunters should travel upon. They cannot touch anything during their stay in the past, and they are only to shoot when told to. Interrupting any of the natural processes in the past could have irreparable repercussions for the future. Step on a mouse, and you leave your print, like the Grand Canyon, across eternity. They're very careful with leaving the past just as it was supposed to unfold. The T-Rex that they were supposed to kill was going to be crushed by a tree only seconds later. It was going to die anyway. Eccles, however, is terrified and runs back to the time machine through the jungle and waits for the others. But once the rest of the crew returns, they notice the mud on Knuckles' boots. Against their better judgment, they allow him to return with the crew back to present day. When they exit the time machine, the crew checks in with the man behind the desk to see if everything is okay, 
and the man tells him it is. The man, however, is acting a bit different from before they left. There's a strange smell in the air. It's faint, but it's there. The sign on the wall is different. The words were spelled differently. Eccles sits down and checks every inch of his body for things he could have ruined. And on his boot, caked in the mud, he finds a butterfly. Beautiful and dead. The death of a single butterfly has somehow resulted in the future being changed. He cries out in disbelief, begging to return to the past and somehow undo what he's done. He sits down with his eyes closed and senses a crew member enter the room. The crew member breathes loudly and takes the safety off his rifle. Eccles opens his eyes, but suddenly, all he hears is a sound of thunder. It used to be thought that events that changed the world were things like big bombs, huge earthquakes, or other large-scale events. But it has now been realized that this is a very old-fashioned view held by people totally out of touch with modern thought. The things that changed the world are the tiny things. A butterfly flapped its wings in the Amazon, and subsequently a storm ravages half of Europe. Paraphrased a little bit is a quote from a novel named Good Omens. What it's talking about is the butterfly effect. Sensitive dependence on initial conditions, more commonly known as the butterfly effect, is the idea that a small change in any situation could have huge implications later on down the road. The idea was coined by Edward Lorenz in the 1950s. Lorenz was a meteorologist who was searching for a means of predicting the weather. He was conducting experiments with various numbers to try and model a weather prediction. He did a previous experiment with an initial condition of 0.506127, six significant digits, a little bit overkill he thought, so this time his initial condition was only 0.506. Three significant digits should be fine. So we left the room to get a cup of coffee and came back to something drastically different from what he had previously. At first things seemed normal and they seemed to follow the first experiment one to one, but after a while they started to diverge and looked like completely different models. A 0.03% difference in values had enormous long term implications. It may seem insignificant, it's just a model, right? Well Lorenz had actually just opened the door to a new way of thinking and seeing the world around us. Chaos theory is the branch of mathematics that focuses on exactly this kind of thinking, but its name is kind of deceiving. The butterfly effect doesn't represent chaos, but rather the effects of changing the slightest conditions and then observing the results. Think of this. It is easier to predict the orbital period of a planet in another star system 10 million years from now than it is for us to predict our own weather here on Earth just a month from today. Because in order for us to predict the weather long term, we would have to know the exact position and momentum of every molecule of air on the planet and how they interact with each other. For planetary orbits, it's just a lot easier, there's a lot less variables. Any university physics student could probably calculate it. As for the weather, a butterfly flapping its wings creates a minuscule and almost unnoticeable change in atmospheric pressure. But these changes compound over and over and over as time progresses, until, as widely known, the butterfly's wings cause a tornado in Texas. This inevitable growth of errors is called deterministic chaos, chaos that can be determined, measured. However, the butterfly itself cannot cause a tornado. The butterfly represents an unknowable quantity. We can never reverse engineer an event to find out what exactly tipped the system, there's just too many factors that could have gone into it. No choice you've ever made has been an isolated event. It's like a domino effect that keeps compounding over time. The world and society is like a network. And when a certain part of that network fails, it affects everything else. Chaos theory isn't random, even though it seems like it. To prove it, let's play chaos game. Take a piece of paper and make three points like such. We'll label them A, B, and C. Now, choose a random point in the middle of those three points. We'll just put it right here. Now, all you have to do is make a point halfway between your starting point and point A. From this point, make a point halfway between here and point B. Repeat the process for point C and continue this pattern, rotating between points A, B, and C. If you do this for long enough, you'll see something interesting start to happen. As more and more generations of these points are drawn, an image starts to emerge. From seemingly random points being drawn, from chaos, from disorder, this complex yet orderly figure shows its face. From drawing a few points and following certain rules, chaos can form order. It's a fractal, they're infinitely complex patterns that are self-similar across any scale. This shows that, with enough time, random actions can have serious long-term effects. 
The butterfly effect isn't exactly how you'd expect science to be. Physics, math, and many other scientific fields are based on predictability. You know, predicting the orbit of planets in order to send satellites and probes there. Or predicting the odds of an asteroid hitting the Earth. The butterfly effect is the complete opposite. It's a model that exposes the flaws in other models. It says that without a perfect knowledge of initial conditions, any prediction is basically useless. But although the butterfly effect exposes flaws in other models, it also brings to light the impact that everything, including each of us, has. Jonas Salk is credited for having found the first vaccines for polio. Had he not discovered that at the time he did, the entire population of the planet today would be vastly different. Some people wouldn't have been born. Entire family lines may have been cut off due to the lack of a vaccine. Perhaps some of the largest companies today would not have been created if it weren't for this specific event happening at this specific time. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, a Russian nuclear-armed submarine was stationed off the coast of Cuba. American ships detected the submarine and began using depth charges to signal that the submarine should surface. The crew on board, though, took these depth charges to be bombs. The captain of the ship believed that war had broke out between the United States and the Soviet Union and ordered a nuclear torpedo to be sent immediately. Everyone agreed, except for one officer, Vasily Arkhipov. Without a unanimous vote, no action could be taken, and thus World War III was prevented. This one man's decision is the reason that the United States and Russia today aren't nuclear wastelands. The butterfly effect affects everything. Do you really have control of your life? Like, everything? No, but you and I have huge effects on the world as well. The butterfly effect is not to get leverage, it's not saying that every small thing always has a big impact. If that were true, then in a way you could manipulate it. Think of it like Jenga. You take away a certain block and things can be just fine. But another block, that one special block, if removed, causes everything else to fall apart. The reality is you have no idea what thing, or what block, will change your future. So everything has a say in it. For example, you watching this video will take up about 10 minutes of your day, whether it's for a good reason or not. Could me watching a movie, or listening to a song, getting a video idea from it, researching it, writing it, editing it, and uploading it to where you see it on your YouTube feed at a specific time prevent something bad from happening to you? Maybe you watching this video prevented you from going to the store 10 minutes early, where if you had left 10 minutes ago, a car that runs a red light would smash into you in an intersection, killing you. It's a scary thought, but it's a possibility. Someone recently messaged me and said that they had saw someone watching one of my videos in their classroom right next to them. They started to talk, become friends, and now they're dating. If YouTube wasn't a platform, if I hadn't had that specific video idea, that wouldn't have happened, and maybe those two people would have never met. But it goes much further than that. Everything has led you and I to this very moment, literally everything. Because the universe exists, because the universe is expanding, and because the temperature of the universe was just right to the point that stellar nurseries can form stars, without those stars, we wouldn't have supernovas. Without supernovas, we wouldn't have iron. Without iron, we couldn't exist. Every day you breathe, I hope, and when you exhale, you exhale carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide, through the help of plants and photosynthesis, creates more oxygen. Oxygen that people hundreds of years from now might breathe. Everything you do, no matter how small it is, will change the future in one way or another. People who lived hundreds of years ago have had an effect on the world as it is today. The things you do today will ripple throughout time. The small things you create today can be the big things that the next generation builds upon. In a way, you can live forever. So the next time something big happens in your life, just think. It didn't happen by accident. Just as the butterfly effect suggests, everything you do today will change your future drastically. Skills you learned today could come in handy in ways you could never expect 10 years from now. Just like the fractals we talked about, one small random action can have serious implications down the road. Let Brilliant help start this domino effect. Brilliant actually helped me further understand fractals, and how the math behind it creates infinite pieces of art. They have a whole section based on the Mandelbrot set, which is what you're looking at right now. Not only do they have courses on fractals, but plenty of other topics such as logic, group theory, probability, and many more. You can take as many of these courses as you'd like with Brilliant's premium subscription. If you have one of the first 200 people to sign up using the link in the description, you'll receive 20% off your premium subscription. So go learn a new skill. You'd be surprised on where it might take you.
It seemed like a normal Tuesday at the head office of the athletic apparel company, DGS. Unbeknownst to most of the employees, however, the company had just been bought out by one of its competitors and was now being forced to accommodate a new internal structure requiring several major cutbacks. Along with many others, Jess McDonald, employee of four years, would get let go this day. Ever since Jess was a young teenager, she had wanted to work for DGS. It was her favorite childhood company. She calculated her entire high school, college, and early career decisions according to this goal. And now, after four years at the company, she had finally started to establish a little seniority and was beginning to move upwards. Not enough to be one of the employees who was kept, but enough for it to sting extra bad when she was fired. On her last day, Jess left the office devastated by the idea of needing to start over, with essentially no hope left for her working at her dream company. She walked several city blocks to the bus she took home, which felt like the longest and most shameful walk of her life. A few blocks from the bus stop, Jess found herself caught behind a small group of people walking at an infuriatingly slow speed. Jess, who thought she was already walking slow enough, suddenly had to reduce her speed a noticeable amount. Are you kidding me? How does an entire group of people walk this slow? Jess thought to herself. Within a few steps, Jess became almost sure that the group was willfully ignoring her presence behind them with no regard for anyone other than themselves. They were, as far as Jess was concerned, entirely in her way, planted there to make her already horrible day even worse. Finally, Jess impatiently squeezed her way through the group, bumping shoulders with two of the individuals in the row. As she did, she said, excuse me, which sounded much more like, get out of my way, than excuse me. Then she walked on past them. Little did Jess know, one of the two people she bumped shoulders with was a young man named David, who six months prior had been diagnosed with early onset amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as ALS, a terminal disease that destroys the body's muscles by affecting cells throughout the brain and spinal cord. David's family and friends were out for a lunch and a walk with him. He was still early enough in the progression of the disease to appear healthy, but of course, David was walking slowly because of this. His ability to walk was the first to start to go, and David was now forced to either take a wheelchair or walk slowly and methodically. When Jess plowed through him and the small row of his friends and family, David immediately became sad and ashamed, reminded of the fact that he was dying and becoming a nuisance to others around him. Then he thought about how inconsiderate and selfish the woman was who bumped into him, and how the world appeared to be playing a cruel joke on him, which quickly turned his sadness into anger. Then, when David's mom Kathy asked David if he was okay and suggested that they go home, David snapped at her. He felt like his mom babied and embarrassed him with no ability to understand what he was going through. I only have a few years left, mom. Please stop ruining them. David said to her in an impulse of anger and weakness. Of course, this crushed David's mom, but because of David's own suffering and his mom's attempt to be strong and not make the situation about her, David was not properly aware of the magnitude of his mom's suffering and how horribly this affected her. Later that day, first chance she got, David's mom stopped by the liquor store. She had been there a lot recently. While in line at the register, one of the four people in front of her was an older man with a cart filled with what looked to be at least 35 bottles of various wines and liquors, requiring a huge, obnoxious amount of time for his transaction. David's mom looked at the old man with complete and utter disdain, thinking to herself, who buys this much alcohol at once? I bet you're an alcoholic stocking up for the month. She felt like the man was placed specifically in her way to make her loathe in the bright lights of the liquor store, sober and miserable. Then, when the man asked if he got the proper discount on one of the two-for-one bottles, causing the cashier to need to go back through the transaction, David's mom was sure he had no regard for her or anyone else in line and said, Oh my god, are you serious? Soft enough for her to think it might go unheard, but loud enough for the man to hear it. The man looked up and over to her, disgusted by her impatience. The man was in fact stocking up, but for the wake of one of his longtime best friends who had passed just a couple days prior. The man thought to himself how horribly inconsiderate and nasty David's mom must be to be so impatient over a couple extra minutes. Then he thought of the woman who cut him off on the way there and then flipped him off when he honked at her. Then he thought about how he was the only one doing any of the work to set up the funeral and prepare for the wake of his friend. He wondered why everything was out to get him. When the man finally left the line and began driving home, on the way, he passed through a toll booth. One that for some reason still had a human in it. The toll was $1.50. The old man pulled up to the window and in a state of exhausted anger and inconsiderateness, nearly threw the money at the collector without looking at him. The collector had nothing particular going wrong in his life at this moment. He was, however, just generally miserable. He was dealt a bad hand at birth and now he spent his life in dead-end jobs, working in horrible monotony, which, by this point, had turned him rather bitter and apathetic. Unpleasant experiences like this were standard on the job and didn't phase him at all. 
In fact, he basically forgot about it as soon as the next driver in line pulled up. The toll collector looked at the next driver with dead eyes and said, $1.50. The male driver in the next car took a dollar from his wallet and scrambled his car for 50 cents, having not originally realized that the toll was more than a dollar. The toll collector visibly rolled his eyes and audibly exhaled, while the driver frantically looked in the car compartments that would normally have change. Then the collector said, Yeah, maybe next time have it ready, huh, shithead? The driver looked up at the collector and thought, What's wrong with you? I should beat the hell out of you for talking to me like that. The driver had just gotten in a fight with his girlfriend and was fully ready to take it out on someone. The driver imagined getting out of his car and punching the collector in the face. Then he thought to himself, Maybe he's having a bad day. Maybe something's wrong or something horrible has happened to him recently. Maybe he's not normally like this. Then, the driver found two quarters in the bottom section of his car's front console and handed the money to the collector. Have a good rest of the day, man. The driver said sincerely, nodding his head with a slight smile before driving off. Of course, the driver was wrong. It was a normal day for the collector and nothing was going any worse than any other day. Even though the driver was wrong, the interaction costed him exactly $1.50. No more, no less. I'm not trying to put you down. It's an expression of you as you are. One must live. We need to survive. To go on. We must go on. this very second, you are on a narrow ledge between life and death. You probably don't feel it, but there's an incredible amount of activity going on inside you. And this activity can never stop. Picture yourself as a slinky falling down an escalator moving upwards. The falling part represents the self-replicating processes of your cells. The escalator represents the laws of physics driving you forwards. To be alive is to be in motion, but never arriving anywhere. If you reach the top of the escalator, there's no more falling possible and you are dead forever. Somewhat unsettlingly, the universe wants you to reach the top. How do you avoid that and why are you alive? <laughs> 